I'm ready to worship, so let's get started. Thank you. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Let's all stand and greet those around us in the name of the Lord. this morning to worship the Lord. So let's do that.
We're having church, ladies and gentlemen. Let's continue our time of worship, a praise and worship song. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. This morning, great is thy faithfulness. Morning, my 
Father and our God, it's with joy that we can come to your throne of grace. And thank you, Lord, for this day and the opportunities and privileges you've given us. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you're always there, your pre very present help in the time of trouble, that you'll never leave us, never forsake us. And Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness in saving our souls, knowing that you paid our sin debt in at Calvary. You took our place. You did that for us, which we could not do, and we thank you for it. And thank you that the marvelous grace of our loving Lord is greater than all of our sins. We thank you for the faithfulness there. Lord, I pray your blessings on this <coughs> service. Be with uh, Marty as he comes to preach your word, Lord. I pray the word of God will go forth and speak to hearts and encourage the saved this day, Lord. And I pray that it will draw those who don't know you as their Savior unto the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Have your will and way in this service. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our staff. I pray your blessings on them. And Lord, I pray you'll be with this offering. Bless the gift and the giver. And Lord, I pray it'll be used to bring <coughs> honor and glory to our wonderful, faithful God, Jesus Christ, my Savior, in whose name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Psalms chapter 146 verses 3 through 10 says this, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that here therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. 
The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Brothers and sisters, knowing these things, how can we keep from singing his praises? Choir's going to lead us now.
city called glory so bright and so fair as I entered the gates I cried holy the angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion. And oh, the sights that I saw. Then I said, I want to see Jesus, the one who died for all. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, Holy. sang glory glory to the son of God as I entered the gates of that city the streets of heaven and all the seats well there were too many to tell and I saw Abraham Jacob and Isaac and I talked with Mark and my dad and Timothy but then I said Timothy I want to see Jesus because he's the one he's the one who
light your fire, your wood's wet. Amen. <laughs> Man. Thank you, TJ and choir, all of our musicians. Man, this has been a great, great day so far. And we're yet in store for more. I just want to take a brief moment to introduce our special guest today. His name is Marty Dupree. He's a consultant for adult evangelism and discipleship at our North Carolina Baptist State Convention. Marty's a dear friend and brother in the Lord. And if you missed our Sunday school hour, you missed a blessing. Uh, but Marty will be here uh, this evening as well. And so I want to encourage you to be here for our evening service at 630. I think uh, TJ will be having choir practice as well. Uh, but God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being here this, this morning. And for those of you that are visiting with us, it's been a joy to have you. And hope and pray you and trust that you'll be blessed for having come to worship with us today. Brother Marty, you come on and share with us, brother. Thank you, Thank Pastor you, Danny. God is good all the time. Folks, that's true when we don't think so, we don't feel like it, and the circumstances don't dictate it. God is still good all the time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Where did TJ go? Oh, he's gone out to, well, hey, he did a great job. He's off to a good start, isn't he? <laughs> all right. Well, it's exciting to be here today. I really appreciate the opportunity and honor that uh, uh, Danny has invited me to come and speak and teach. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Baptist State Convention and Milton Hollifield, our executive director and treasurer. And I want to thank you all for your giving through the cooperative program. Folks, uh, we partner together through giving to send missionaries, thousands of them literally all over the world. We plant churches in multiple languages all over North America. And it allows people like myself to be a state missionary, to travel and speak and teach and train people all over the state. Uh, Elkin has a very special place for me. Um, one of the special things about Elkin is I was here on 9-11. Uh, was over at Elkin Valley Baptist Church. I've been at that church a number of times. I've been in your association meetings a number of times. And been with your, uh, I guess we're competing with the children's thing. So uh, maybe I need more volume. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get wound up here in a minute. But anyway, I just, I love this area. And it's always a privilege and honor to be here. I was with your association back in the fall. And so uh, I appreciate you inviting me and uh, looking forward to being here today. So thank you. Um, we're going to jump in. We were talking about uh, lifestyle evangelism and I talked about uh, sharing our faith in creative ways and talked about prayer. And uh, we're going to continue um, talking about it. There's a picture of my family. Uh, I introduced them a little bit earlier. I have five children and I have three daughters. Having all these kids will increase your prayer life, but I just want to tell you, having one daughter will increase your prayer life. Amen. Um, I introduced him earlier, my wife Angela, uh, she and I met at a missions conference in Kansas City, Missouri with 22,000 students. It was a great commission conference sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ. Found out we were both students in Chapel Hill. Uh, we lived on the same street on Rosemary Street, five houses from each other, and met in Kansas City, Missouri. Isn't that amazing? Well, my son and his wife, uh, Wheeler and Logan, they both were students at NC State. They met in the Atlanta airport on their way to Missouri to work at a Christian camp, Camp Canacut. So isn't that amazing? So anyway, and then uh, Courtney's 21 and Darcy's 20, and they're um, in, uh, at East Carolina. They were in the Amazon this summer uh, on a medical mission team. Uh, Darcy is going into nursing, and Courtney's a communications major. But the best text I got from the whole summer was about 7 o'clock one morning. We got a text from Courtney. said, Mom and Dad... You'll be glad to know that yesterday we saw an entire village pray to receive Christ on the Amazon. Isn't that amazing? So that'll make your day. And my wife and uh, Dawson just got back from Thailand a week before last. A uh, team from our church went to minister to missionaries in Central Asia uh, in a country where it's against the law to be a Christian, very difficult Muslim country. And uh, they bring them out of uh, that area to bring them to Thailand for people to minister to them for about a week so they can go back in. They're kind of special forces missionaries. And so uh, my son and wife had a chance to do that. So anyway, it's a lot of fun having all these kids. Well, let me tell you a fun story and then we'll jump into our message. There was this little girl and she went to the pediatrician and she was a shy little girl and he was trying to connect with her. So he's talking to her about Sesame Street and talking to her about Barney and Dora the Explorer. So he puts the tongue depressor in her mouth and says, am I going to find the cookie monster in your mouth? And the little girl says, no, sir. And he looks in her ear and says, am I going to find big bird in your ear? The little girl says, no, no, sir. Then he puts the stethoscope on her heart. He said, am I going to find Dora the Explorer in your heart? Now, this question, the little girl pops up. She says, no, sir, Jesus is in my heart. Dora's on my underwear. <laughs> she had her priorities right, didn't she? Jesus was in her heart. 
Well, let me ask us a serious question today. If God Almighty, who is the great physician, if he were to put his stethoscope on your heart this morning, what's on your heart this morning? I hope Jesus is on your heart. But let me ask you a question. You don't need to raise your hand, but just nod your head. How many of you all here today have a friend, a relative, associate, a neighbor, uh, somebody you care about, but you're concerned about where they're going to spend eternity? Just nod your head. If you've got somebody, you're concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. Most all of us should have somebody, at least one person on our heart this morning. As we move through our message this morning, I want you to have that person on your mind because at the invitation time today, I'm going to invite you all to to bow down to this altar and pray, to do business with God on behalf of that person that you're concerned about their soul and where they're going to spend eternity. And we're going to look at that, what the Bible talks about that in this message. Now, my daughter Courtney, she's 21 now. She's the one, they all have blonde hair, but hers is the blondest, and that's really her hair color too. Um, But she asked me a question when she was six years old I will never forget. We were in a restaurant. We'd gotten to know the waitress and gotten to know her name and where she was going to school, what she was majoring, all the things you do to connect with her. And she came and laid down our ticket and picked up some of our plates, and she turned to walk away. And Courtney looked up at me with her blue eyes and said, Daddy, aren't you going to tell her about Jesus? And of course I did, but that question's never left me is how can I tell this person about Jesus or who's going to tell them about Jesus? And folks, I hope that'll be on your heart this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in this time of worship. Father, you're the almighty God. You're the God of creation. You're the God of restoration. You're the God of redemption. And Lord, you are the God of salvation. Father, I thank you for our time of worship. I thank you for the beautiful songs that have been sang and the great message in them. I thank you for bringing TJ here to be a part of this church fellowship, to lead them in worshiping you. Father, you're the almighty God. You are worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration and you alone. So, Father, I pray that even now that you would be glorified, that Jesus would be exalted. Father, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts to be receptive. Father, open our eyes that we might see you, that we might see what you're trying to show us. Father, open our ears that we might hear your voice speak into our very hearts. Father, whatever attitudes that we have that might be barriers, Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus you'd remove them. Help us, Lord, to know your attitude as you love us but you hate our sin because you're a holy God. Father, release us from all the distractions, from all the sin that besets us. Transform our lives today, Lord, that we would not be conformed to this world, we would not be conformed to churchianity, but Lord, we would be conformed to biblical Christianity in the image of your son, Jesus. Father, we commit this time to you. May all that need to be saved be saved, and all of us who are saved, may we be concerned about souls who are lost. So Father, we commit this time. Have your way in each of us, even now. Lord Jesus, we pray amen, amen, amen. Folks, I told you that Jesus is the greatest you fill in the blank. I was doing an exercise here on 2000, in 2001 with a group of pastors uh, here in Elkin on different ways to turn a conversation into a spiritual conversation. Jesus is the greatest. And somebody in the back of the room said, hey, Marty, what about a phlebotomist? I said, a phlebotomist? I said, isn't that somebody that studies blood? They said, well, actually, it's somebody that draws blood. Well, I said, that's easy. I said, Jesus is the greatest phlebotomist of all time. He drew his blood for us on the cross. Amen? Well, I, I have a whole lot of kids, so I applied for a whole lot of life insurance, and the insurance company sent a guy to interview me and get a blood sample, and his name was Brian also. And I, I began to engage him in conversation, and I said, Brian, do you know the greatest phlebotomist of all time is? He said, Sir, I'll have to be real honest. I've never thought about that. I said, well, aren't you a phlebotomist? He said, yeah, I've been doing this about 12 years. Nobody's ever asked me that. I said, well, the greatest phlebotomist is Jesus. And I got to explain the gospel and give him a Jesus video. Well, the Rex Blood Mobile comes to the Baptist State Convention, and we're right across from the Carytown Center Mall. I tell people we're on the softer side of Sears. And, and, uh, <laughs> and so they put the, the bus in our parking lot, and they invite people from the mall. And we signed up at different times, and they put me on the bus, and there's five people taking blood and five people giving blood. So they sent me in the bus, and I could tell this lady's going to be fun. She was kind of spunky, and I said, how are you doing today? She said, oh, I'm blessed. I said, me too. I'm too blessed to be depressed. We're already having church, let me just tell you. I said, are you a phlebotomist? She goes, yes, I am. How would you know that? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know the greatest phlebotomist of all time is? She said, yes, I do. It's Jesus Christ. And uh, she was fired up. And I was like, how did you know that? And she kind of had a little dance to her. She said, there's four ladies in my church that do what I do. And my preacher preached a sermon on Jesus is the greatest phlebotomist of all time. And man, she went to preaching right then. You remember I talked about sowing, cultivating, and harvesting. I was just going to sow a seed and have a one-on-one conversation with her. But what I did is I struck a match, and folks, we just had church right there on the bus. I called it the gospel blood bus, amen? (laughs) 
Amen. Folks, you have divine appointments with people who near to hear the gospel, but sometimes you have divine intersections with people who are already Christians and you just have church right there. Amen. I liked it when you said that today. We're going to have church. We're having church. I love that. Hey, folks, it's not just in this building. It's everywhere, every day, everywhere you go. You're the church. You're the body of Christ. And as we live that out, we have church because here's what happens all the time to me. I engage people in one-on-one conversations, but the guy standing behind me in line or just like Will, the bus boy, he was listening in. He even apologized. He said, I couldn't help but be listening in on your conversation as y'all were talking about the Bible. See, folks, we're the church. And as we talk about Jesus and as we share that, people are drawn to that because we're not trying to offend them. We're trying to win them. Amen? All right, if you got your Bibles open, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be in God's Word, and we're going to be looking at many different things today about lostness and why people are lost and how they can be found. If you got your Bible, let me set this up. 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are Paul's last letters. Paul knows that his life is about to come to an end. Folks, if you know that your life is about to come to an end, what you write and what you talk about and what you say is going to be very important. And you're probably going to be pretty passionate about it. In this passage of Scripture, Paul is pretty passionate uh, as he's writing to young Timothy, his young disciple in the faith, and he's talking to him about worship, and he's specifically talking to him about prayer. And then in 2 Timothy, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, hear God's word. He said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a tranquil and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Verse 7, whereunto I am uh, ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, which is truth. Verse 8, I therefore therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. And some translations say without dissension. May God add his blessing, our obedience, and our understanding to his word. Now, in this passage of scripture, it's written in very male language, but in verse 8, he really is talking about men being spiritual leaders. But if you go back up to verse 1, he says, I exhort, therefore, that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings, all different kinds of prayer. But he makes a statement, he says, to, to put it first, first of all, what he's saying is, and he's saying this emphatically, that word exhort is a little bit stronger than encouragement. You can encourage people with words, but exhortation is passionate encouragement. It's kind of like a coach that's encouraging his track star in the last part of the mile. I know you can make it. I know you can make it. It's exhortation. It's cheering them on. To put this in the vernacular, what Paul is saying, folks, is I want you to pray hard. I want you to pray in every way, and I want you to make it a priority. That's what he's really saying is the, the priority of passionate prayer. And as you go on in this passage, And I put part of this up. It says, God our Savior desires all men to be saved. It says that um, that it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior that he will have all men to be saved. Let's talk about that for a minute. God is sovereign, but God does not decree that everybody's going to be saved. But it is his heart's desire. God could just decree that everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to be saved and everybody be saved. But God does not decree that everybody's going to be saved, but it is his heart's desire for their salvation. Amen? So folks, if it's God's desire for people's salvation, should that not also be our desire as well? It sure should be. That's our first big reason why we should pray for and share with lost people. It's because God's word urges us to be concerned about people's salvation. And he talks about that. But he goes on in this passage. This is a rich passage. I'm just unpacking a little bit of it. But he goes on and he says in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What is a mediator? Well, a mediator is like a lawyer. It's an advocate. It's somebody that speaks on your behalf, a mediator. Folks, Jesus is our lawyer. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is the one that stands before the Father on our behalf to say whether or not we get in. Amen? And when he come before him at judgment, people come before him. He said, this one's mine, I die for him. Come on in and we celebrate. This one's mine, I die for her. Come on in, we celebrate. But what happens when somebody comes before him and he says, whoa, depart from me, I never knew you. Folks, that is a tragic reality of eternity without Jesus Christ, amen? 
We're going to come back and deal with that in a moment. But we've got friends and we've got relatives and we've got associates. We've got neighbors who Jesus might say, depart from me, I never knew you. Folks, that's a tragic reality. We don't want that said to anyone, amen? But the next part of this gives us some great hope because Jesus is our lawyer, Jesus is our advocate. But in verse six, it says, he who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Folks, Jesus is our ransom. What is a ransom? Folks, we generally think of a ransom as when somebody has been kidnapped and then somebody has to pay money to buy them back from kidnaptivity. That's a new word. I don't know if that's even a word. I just made that up, kidnaptivity. But we have to pay to buy them back. Okay, that's what Jesus has done for us. The Bible says he has purchased us with his own blood. Folks, he has bought us back. He has ransomed us from this earth, from the evil one, and bought us back. He's paid a price for us that we couldn't pay for ourselves. Amen? Amen. Folks, that's good news. Jesus is our advocate. He's our lawyer. He's the one that went to hell on our behalf. We're going to see that in just a moment. And then, this this is just a loaded passage, but we need to move on. But I love this passage of Scripture. Now, that's our first big reason. God's Word urges us to pray for lost people. Now, look at this uh, statement here. You can't see very, very well, but up in the corner, Matthew 6, 10, we know that as the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer which is really a model prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now think about that prayer for just a moment. How many times do we begin to pray for somebody and we really don't know what to pray? It's like, Lord, help them, Lord, bless them, Lord, save them. But we don't really specifically ask God anything. We just kind of pray a general prayer. Nothing wrong with that. But folks, when we pray God's word, we pray God's heart. And we want to pray the heart of God. So when you pray scripture, you're praying God's heart. Amen? So when you're not sure what to pray for somebody, pray what Jesus told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because isn't that what we really want to? We want God's kingdom to come and his will to be done in their life. I have five children, and by the grace of God, all of them have come to know Christ. All of them have been baptized, and I'm very thankful for that. But you know what? Folks, you can pass on your stuff, and you can pass on your values to your family and friends, but you cannot pass on your salvation and you cannot pass on God's call on your life because God saves people individually and he calls people individually, amen? And so I pray and my wife and I pray, we pray together all the time, we pray a lot, but we pray that God would capture their hearts because we want them to serve the Lord. We pray that God would capture their hearts. So we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Folks, when you're praying for your friends or your children or your your relatives or that person that God's put on your heart today, isn't that what you want for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done in their life? It is what you want. So let's pray that way. Evangelist Sammy Tippett says, when one prays for the will of God and the kingdom of God, he's in essence praying for the same thing. He's praying for Jesus to rule and reign in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. So folks, Let's just pray when we're praying for somebody. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in my children's life and in my nephew's life and so on and so forth. That's how we want to pray. So God's word urges us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray for his kingdom to come. And by the way, Chris Schofield, great prayer guy. Some of y'all have heard Chris. He, He has a statement that I love. He says, you often act on what you pray towards. Whatever it is you're praying towards is what you act on. And the way I would interpret that for us today, as you begin to pray for a lost person, you begin to pray for their soul and begin to pray for God's kingdom to come and will to be done in their life, you're going to be inclined towards them to talk to them, to to engage them and care about them. So God's word told us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray. And now we're going to talk about Paul praying for lost people. In Romans 10.1, Paul says this. He said, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God is for their salvation. Who's he talking about? Well, Paul's talking about his own people. He's talking about the Hebrew people, the Israelites. Now, let's be honest here. Who do we care the most about? We care the most about our own people. We care the most about those closest to us, to our family. Blood is thicker than water. Now, we have friends we care about, but folks, when we really get down to it, if you're at work and you've got a very important project going on that day, but you get a call from your family member and it's a crisis, man, that project has no value or even any worth anymore. You're going home to take care of that crisis. And folks, Paul is praying for his people like in a crisis. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God is for their salvation. But if you want to see how passionate Paul really is in chapter 10, you have to back up to Romans chapter 9. And he says, I'm telling the truth, I lie not. My, the Holy Spirit bear witness in my conscience. That's what he says in Romans 9.1. And then he goes a step further in Romans 9.2 and he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. 
for the sake of my kinsmen, my brethren, according to the flesh. What Paul's saying is his heart is literally broken over his own people. Folks, when's the last time God broke your heart over a neighbor, over a friend, over a family member? We've got to ask God to break our hearts. We get so used to and being comfortable, but we forget that people are dying and really going to hell. It's not a joke. It's not a Halloween idea. It's an eternal separation from God. We've got to ask people, we've got to ask God to break our hearts and soften our hearts because Paul said he had great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart. But then he goes a step further and he says in Romans 9, 3, he said, I wish that I myself were accursed and separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen. Pastor Danny, the first time I read that and really thought about that, I thought to be accursed and separated, is Paul saying what I think he's saying? What Paul's saying is that he would be willing to be separated eternally in a place that, Bible, that the Bible calls hell if all of his people could be saved. I thought, whoa, that's heavy. I began to think about that myself. Would I be willing to do that if everybody could be saved? And I thought, I don't ever want to be separated from Christ. Do you want to be separated from Christ? No. Do you want your friends or family to be separated from Christ? No. And I began to ponder that. It bothered me for a minute. And then all of a sudden, glory, hallelujah, the good news came to mind. We don't have to do that. Jesus has already done it for us on the cross. Amen. When he cried out, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Folks, for a split time in all of eternity, in all of history, God Almighty turned his back on Jesus. And Jesus took on your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world onto himself, such that his heart literally burst within him. In that moment, Jesus experienced hell for us so we would not have to if we accept what he has done for us on the cross. Amen? Amen. See, Jesus experienced hell for us. So that's the good news that we can share in the middle of the bad news. Yes, there is a heaven and yes, there is a hell and we're gonna talk about that some more later. But the good news is that Jesus has experienced it for us, amen? Now, I'm talking about this passage of scripture, a couple of things here. I was jogging in my neighborhood one Saturday morning and one end of the neighborhood has a cul-de-sac, a retired army guy that I had the privilege of baptizing, a retired Navy lady, she moved and right beside the army guy is a retired Air Force guy named Mike and he's from the Northeast. And so I, I saw him one um, morning and um, we were talking and you can kind of tell when somebody has something on their heart and they kind of want to talk. And Mike's a very quiet guy, but he kind of walked out to the edge of the road and he'd been working in his yard. And so I just kind of chit chatted with him for a minute. And then I wanted to turn it to a spiritual conversation. I said, Mike, I said, have you been to St. Mary's church lately? That's the Catholic church in Garner. And I knew his background was Catholic. Here's what he said to me. He said, Marty, he said, I haven't been to church as much as I should, but I've been reading the Bible. And that's what he wanted to talk about. I said, you have? I said, that's interesting. Tell me about that. He said, well, one of the things I discovered is Jesus' suffering didn't begin with the beating and the crucifixion. It began in the garden. And I said, now, Mike, are you talking about the garden of Gethsemane or are you talking about all the way back to Adam and Eve, the garden of Eden? He said, all the way back to Adam and Eve, the garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned and messed up and got kicked out, he said, that's when I believe the suffering began for Christ. I said, you know, I agree with you. He said, but that's not all. He said his greatest pain wasn't even the beating or the crucifixion. It was the separation from the Father on the cross. I said, Mike, are you talking about when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said, yes, Marty, I read that this morning. I said, Mike, that's just incredible insight. I said, their seminary professors don't have that kind of insight. You know what I mean? <laughs> I said, tell me something. That's incredible. I agree with you. But how did you come to that kind of understanding? Folks, his words. He said, Marty, I don't know how to explain it to you. But for about a year now, the Holy Spirit has been drawing me to God's word. And the Holy Spirit has been teaching me God's word. Folks, that's why we pray. That's why we pray. That the Spirit of God would call people and draw people to himself. Amen. And, and as I was running that morning, I was kind of praying and asking God about things in the neighborhood. As I, as I went back up the hill that day, it was like I floated up the hill. And it was like the Lord was speaking to me. Marty, it's not necessarily something you've done, but I have heard your prayers. And yes, I am at work in this neighborhood. I'm at work in the hearts of the people. Folks, that's why we pray. We gotta pray that the Holy Spirit of God would arrest and capture people's hearts and draw and call them to himself. Amen. That's why we pray. Along these same lines, when Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God is for their salvation. It reminds me of my grandmother. My grandmother, Ruth, she died 16 years ago this month. In fact, last week. She was 93 years old. All of you have got somebody in your life that's had a great influence on you. Uh, and spiritually, my grandmother, family-wise, is the most influential person in my life. My grandmother taught me to pray. Danny, I was never with my grandmother when she didn't say, let's pray. And But what she always prayed for was people's souls. 
She prayed for other things too, but she always prayed for people's salvation. Now, my grandmother was a quiet lady. Her name was Ruth. She never spoke out loud in church. She never had an office. And she grew up on a farm in Benson, North Carolina. That's southeast of Raleigh. And most of my life, she lived on a farm in Four Oaks, which is near Smithfield in Johnston County. She had 250-some people at her funeral. That's a lot of people for a 93-year-old who's in a rural area. One person after another said, Miss Ruth did this for me, or Miss Ruth prayed that for me. She had um, influenced a lot of people through her prayer life. But when she was 86 years old, she gave me a stack of poems and two cards. And she said, Marty, I want you to share this at my funeral. I said, well, Grandmother, you're doing good. You're still driving and going about. She said, oh, yes, but don't ever pray for me to stay because when that time comes, I'm ready to go. Folks, that's a question for all of us today. Are you ready to go? Whether you're eight years old or 18 or 28 or 88, it doesn't matter. We need to be ready to go when that time comes. Amen? And those, that stack of poems was about the cross and the crown. And then she gave me two cards, and this really grabbed my heart. One of the cards had her mission statement on it. It said, may I live a life that will light someone's pathway and they'll see Christ in my life. Well, my grandmother lived out her mission statement. Do you have a mission statement for your life? And the other card is the one that reminded me of Paul. And it said this. It said, my greatest desire in life is to know that all of my family is saved and living in the ark of safety knowing Jesus as our Savior and ready to meet him when that day comes. Isn't that precious? I mean, isn't that what you want for your friends and family, to be living in the ark of safety, knowing Jesus as their Savior <clears throat> and ready to meet him when that day comes? That's what my grandmother wrote, and that's what she prayed, and it sounds so much exactly like what Paul said. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God is for their salvation. Folks, I hope that's your heart today. So the Bible tells us, Jesus told us, Paul modeled it. Now, as we look at these conditions of lostness, we're gonna hit this pretty quickly. But I want to kind of give you this up front. Do not let this be sterile information. I know you could be sitting here today and say, I know the Bible says that. I want you to personalize this. I want you to personalize this uh, yourself and think this is who I would have been without Christ. Or perhaps you're here today without Christ. This is what it says about you. But also this is what it says about that person that's without Christ that you're praying for that God's put on your heart today. So as we begin to look at this, let's look at what God's word says. First of all, without Christ, we're blind. We're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4 says that the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. The gods of this age have blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that we may not see the glory of the gospel of Christ, which is the image of God. Folks, we're spiritually blind. Until God opens our eyes, we're blind spiritually. Now, have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you could not get them to see things your way? Parents, if you've had a teenager, you've had that conversation. Trying to get them to see things your way. Teenagers, if you have a parent, <laughs> you've had that conversation of trying to get them to see things your way. I know it works both ways. But folks, until God opens our eyes, we're spiritually blind. My pastor, Dr. Hugh Garner, <clears throat> taught at Fruitland. A great preacher from South Georgia and loved Jesus. I came home from college one day. I was all fired up about some social issue. I don't remember what it was, but... Uh, I asked him, I said, Dr. Garner, tell me something. Why don't you preach much on social issues? He said, well, son, in his grandfatherly way, until they get Jesus right, they're not gonna get their social issues right. So I'm just gonna preach Jesus till they get Jesus right, amen? <laughs> Folks, we can't try to persuade people to our opinion or to our way, but we gotta pray that God will open their eyes to the truth that they might see who Jesus is, amen? Because that's what really matters. We got to make sure we get Jesus right. So pray that God would open their eyes to, to their blindness. The second thing is bound. If you still got your Bibles in Timothy, you can uh, flip over to 2 Timothy 2.24 uh, and 25. And now Paul's talking to Timothy about being a soldier of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about being a servant soldier. And I want to read this to you. He says, in meekness, some translations may say in gentleness, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if God paraventure, which means if God perhaps will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth, that they may recover themselves, that means come to their senses, a right way of thinking, out of the snare of the devil who has taken them captive at his will. Now, folks, this passage is a loaded passage. Notice it says, with meekness, which is strength under control, or gentleness. That's how we'd approach people. It says, with meekness or gentleness, correcting or confronting those who are in opposition. And then it says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance. See, it's our responsibility to tell them the truth, to tell them, to confront them with truth in a loving, careful way. But it's God's responsibility to save them, amen? See, it's up to us to tell them, but only God can save them. It says, if perhaps 
the, the King James says, if peradventure, but it means if perhaps God may grant them repentance. See, you and I can't talk people into it. If you and I talk people into something, somebody else can talk them out of it. But when God moves on their heart and brings them to repentance, then there's a transformation, amen? But notice it goes on that they may uh, come to their right way of thinking, that they may uh, come to the to their senses, it says in some translations. It's like this, if this is God and we're walking away from God, we always talk about repentance as making a U-turn and coming back to God. That's a physical turning around. But the, the language that's being used here is the word metanoia, which is the word for repentance, one of the words for it, but it's the idea of changing your mind. It's like you're going away from God and you've got some stinking thinking. And all of a sudden you realize, I'm not thinking right. I'm not in my right mind. I'm not thinking like I should. I need to think like God wants me to think. And you have a change of mind as well as a change of heart and you have repented and you've come back to him. And then the Bible says, and you escape from the snare of the devil. That's good hunting and fishing language. That concept of a snare is, as a, is like a bear trap. It's like you've stepped in a trap and shoop, that trap's got you and you can't get out of that trap. Somebody else has to come and push that lever and open that trap to allow you to escape. That's the language that's being used there. Folks, when we're praying for somebody's soul, they are held captive by the evil one. We are engaged in a spiritual battle. Amen? That's like sermon four in this series. We won't get to that. But folks, we've got to make sure we're fighting the right battles. We fight the wrong battles in churches sometimes. When we're arguing over colors and cushions and carpets and curtains and all that stuff, that's personal preference stuff. That doesn't even matter tomorrow. But when you start praying for a lost person and you start sharing your faith, you've now stepped onto the battlefield, but it's the right battle because it's an eternally significant battle. Amen? So folks, when we're praying for somebody who's ensnared by Satan, we're praying for them to be set free. And we know that Isaiah said that someday a Messiah would come to set the captives free, and that Messiah is Jesus. Amen? So we're praying for them to be set free. So people without Christ, they're blind, they're bound. We're also condemned. And folks, we're condemned by our own sin. I trust that you know John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you get to verse 17, it says, God did not send his son into the world to judge or condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Amen? Then you get to verse 18, and you can see that on the screen a little bit. I've underlined that. John 3, 18, it says, He who believes is not condemned or is not judged, but he who does not believe is condemned already because of his unbelief. So, folks, we're condemned by our own sin. We're condemned by our own lack of belief. We don't even have to condemn one another. So we're already condemned. So we're blind, we're bound, we're condemned. Now, this next one is a heavy one. Folks, without Christ, we are under God's wrath and we are destined for hell. Now, folks, you and I, we don't like this. If you and I were writing the Bible, we wouldn't put this in here. But you know what? We didn't write the Bible. Men inspired by God wrote the Bible. But here's the amazing thing. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody, but he's the one that came to do something about it. Amen? That's the good news. In John 3, 36, it says, He who believes in the only begotten Son of God has eternal life. But he who does not believe, the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God. Folks, what is the wrath of God? In simple terms, the wrath of God is a perfect, holy God's hatred and intolerance towards sin or anything unholy or unrighteous. God loves us, yes, he does, but he hates our sin because he's a holy God. Now, let me raise a question and try to answer it. If God is a loving God and he loves people unconditionally, why does there have to be a hell? Why does there even have to be a place of hell? Why does there have to be an eternal separation from God? Well, T.J. sang about it earlier. Folks, it comes down to this. Almighty God is holy. He's holy, holy, holy. The angels in a typical response chant in the heavens constantly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. Folks, we've gotten away from that in our culture. We've gotten away from that in our church culture. We've got this idea that God's our buddy and we can give him a noogie or something. Don't get me wrong, he's Abba Father. We can sit in his lap and talk to him as a loving father, loving grandfather, but God's not our buddy. God is other than us. He is creator, we're his creation. He did not create us for us. He created us for himself and for his purpose and his glory. You think about our military I know a number of you served in the military. I appreciate that greatly. My dad served in Korea for three years. I have a son in the army now. So I, I'm a patriot. I, I love this country. But I want to say this. We've got to, to recognize that as patriots, we should rally around the flag, and we should rally around the flag and pray for our country. But as Christians, we've got to rally around the cross because the flag is temporary, but the cross is eternal. Amen? Amen. So when we're thinking about, about what Jesus has done, his holiness, he says... You know, he's holy, holy, holy. Well, 
in that, there's two aspects of God. He, is un, he loves people unconditionally. Right here in Wilkes County or, or Yadkin County or Surrey County, we're right here at all of it. He loves people that will die today or tomorrow and never know about the love of Jesus. Folks, that's our mission is to tell them about his love. Amen? But the other aspect of a holy God is he's a just God. And because he's a just God, he can't allow anything unholy or unrighteous or sinful to come into his presence and even exist. Moses said, Lord, can I see your face? He basically told Moses, no, you can't see me and live, but you can hide in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by and you can be sunburned by my afterglory. Now, that's not exactly what it says, but that's exactly what happened. Moses hid in the cleft of the rock and the glory of the Lord passed by and Moses was sunburned by the backside of the glory of God. That's how awesome God is. That's why Moses wore a veil. Really, he wore the veil to because once the glory had moved, he didn't want people to know the glory had gone. But nonetheless, he wore a veil because he'd been burned by the backside of the glory of God. That's the awesomeness and the holiness of God. So when you think about why there has to be a hell, it's because God is holy. And in his holiness, he's perfectly just, but he's also perfectly loving. And look at this, folks. Because he loves people unconditionally that don't even know it, he sent Jesus to be our covering. He sent him to be our righteousness, to be our holiness. Because when we stand before God at judgment, we're going to stand before him. If we stand before him in our humanity, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But when we stand before him covered by the blood of Jesus, covered by the righteousness of Christ, he says, come on in, you're mine. Let's go back to our illustration earlier. There's people standing before him at judgment and Jesus said, come on in, this one's mine, I died for him. Come on in to this lady, celebrate your inheritance. But what happens when somebody comes before him? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. That person, Matthew 7, 21 and following, but Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles and cast out demons in your name? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Folks, the tragic reality of that, that's a religious person. That's a church person doing things in Jesus' name. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. Folks, he's not looking at our list of what we've done for him. He's looking to see whether or not we reside, that he resides in us. He's not looking at us, he's looking for his son in us. Amen, and when he sees his son in us, come on in, you're mine. Folks, we've got to remember that. That's the real question. Have you really surrendered to Jesus? Are we just doing church? Are we just doing religious stuff? Are we going through the motions or do we really know Jesus? That's a very important question that we all have to reconcile in our hearts. And that's also what uh, we need to help our friends reconcile as well. Amen? Now, I know this is a heavy topic, but I'm going to tell you a very funny story and I'll give you permission to laugh. My wife, for her 40th birthday, decided she wanted to go snow skiing. I said, snow skiing? Are you kidding me? You hadn't been in 12 years. She said, yep. She said, you can go to Beach Mountain. It's retro Wednesdays. It's 1970s prices. It's only $25 for a lift ticket and skis. I said, honey, $25, that sounds like our copay on our insurance. <laughs> We're going to get hurt. <laughs> she said, no, we'll get somebody to keep the tribe and we'll go up. Sure enough, we went up. It was in January and we went up and it snowed that night. It was 27 degrees the next day. Beautiful blue day like it is today. The wind wasn't blowing, but it was cold. And uh, I slipped and fell on the shuttle going up the slope. And this guy from New Jersey, I'm laying on my back, flat on my back, said, hey, buddy, I hope that's not an indication of your day. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> so fortunately, I skied without getting hurt, and I did fall down again on getting back on the shuttle. But we had lots of opportunities to share on the sh shuttles and different times. But the last run of the afternoon, I had a most interesting experience. Uh, my wife said, hey, I'm not going to go to the top again. I'll meet you back in the ski lodge. I'm going to do the little green slope. But I wanted to ski the long trail from the top one more time. And I get on this quad lift with these three dudes. Now, they called me dude. They called each other dude. They said dude every third word. They could have starred in this movie, Dude, Where's My Car? I mean, here's these guys. They're 19, 20-year-old guys. They're from Atlanta, I find out. They're Appalachian students. They're skipping school for retro Wednesdays, cheap prices. So anyway, they got the long toboggans all the way down the ground. They don't even have on coats. They got these big old T-shirts. And here I am, I'm the 40-something-year-old guy. I got these big old honking skis and big old honking ski poles. And these guys are all little trick skis. But you got to picture this. I'm, I'm dude number one, there's dude number two, dude number three, and dude number four. And right when this lift moves, these guys simultaneously, laughing their heads off, are scooping up snow, like with the arms like plows. And here all three of them are sitting with like cannonball-sized snowballs in their lap. Folks, this is a boys will be boys at its finest. I thought they were laughing at me, and now I realize they're laughing so hard they can't even talk. They've been doing this all day long. I said, hey, guys, in just a minute, my wife's going to come out from behind those trees. She's got curly blonde hair. You can't miss her. They're ready to drop their <laughs> ordinance on her. <laughs> she cuts and goes another direction, and they start hollering at her. Woo, go, girl. My wife doesn't like a lot of attention. She looks up and kind of waves at me like, what is going on? And I just like, you know, 
these guys are yelling at her. So anyway, they selectively dropped their ordinance, and it was a lot of fun. They didn't hit anybody, but it was fun laughing with them. Well, it's kind of hard to handle a gospel track, which I call a Bible study with ski gloves, but I, I had some of these little cards with me. And then you pull them out of your ski bibs, and I just passed them down. It's got artwork, Michelangelo artwork on one side, and it's got the cross and explanation on the other. I know you can't see that, but nonetheless, I passed them down. and said, hey, guys, let me test your art history. So I slid it down, and they looked at Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, some dude painted that some church in Italy, right? I said, yeah, do you remember his name? He goes, the Leonardo da Vinci dude. Well, I said, well, actually, it was the Michelangelo dude, and that church you're talking about, it's called the Sistine Chapel. It's in the Vatican in Rome. But if you remember, on the ceiling of the Vatican, Michelangelo painted a picture of God in the clouds and the angels reaching down to Adam in the garden, and, and it shows the hand of man and the hand of Adam. I said, but if you remember the story, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They messed up. They got kicked out of the garden. That was the disconnect with God. I said, but I flipped it over. I said, but if you see the cross, the cross is like a bridge back to God. That's how he reached back down. That's in a personal way. It's through Jesus and the cross. About the time I said that, I'm dude number one. Dude number four leans out and he goes, hey, dude, by the way, I'm a Christian, but these dudes, they're going straight to hell. I mean, straight to hell. And he just lit into them. It was very abrupt, and we all started laughing. I really didn't think the guy was serious. I actually thought he was mocking me. I thought, this guy's yanking my chain, man. He's just messing with me. And so we, we laughed for a second. And a few minutes later, he goes, man, it's 27 degrees. And they're just cooling off before they go straight to hell. And he lit back into them. And we laughed. And, and, and after they calmed down a minute, I said, guys, I said, I know we're laughing at what the dude said. I said, but honestly, it's not really funny. I said, that's really what the Bible says about a person who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. That's when he chimes back in again. He goes, I know it, man, I know it. That's what I've been trying to tell him. That's what I've been trying to tell him. I thought, well, maybe he is serious. When we got off at the top of the mountain, they're going down, down the Black Diamond. I would never do that. I'm going down the Long Blue Trail. But the guy says to me, thank you for preaching to my buds. I've been preaching to them too. I said, oh, man, I could tell you were preaching to them. But you know what? He was trying to be funny. And he really was trying to be funny, but he was trying to communicate a truth for you, through being funny. But you know what? The, the topic is not funny. It is a reality of eternity without Christ. So folks, with love in our heart and tears in our eyes, we need to tell our friends and our family about being eternally separated from Christ. But we don't have to be because Jesus finished work on the cross. Amen? Jesus has done it for us, but we have to accept and receive what he has done for us. So these are our conditions. Without Christ, we're blind. I need to have our eyes open. We're bound. We're held captive. We're condemned. We're under God's wrath. We're destined for hell. We're helpless. John 6, Jesus is speaking. He said, no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. Folks, that's why we got to pray, that the Spirit of God would draw people to himself. And then the last thing, if you got your Bible still open in Ephesians 2, we'll look at this very quickly. But Ephesians chapter 2, I call this the Clint Eastwood passage of the Bible because this has got the good, the bad, and the ugly all in one passage. I'm glad y'all got that. It starts off with the really bad and the ugly. And it says, He hath quickened you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. That means we are spiritually dead. It says, Where in time past you have walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse 3, Among whom we also have had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of our mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Folks, that's the bad news. We're children of wrath. There's some hip-hop group called Naughty by Nature. I don't know if they got it from the Bible, but they got it right. Folks, we are naughty by nature. You don't have to teach people how to sin, amen? We have to teach people how not to sin. See, that's the bad news. That's how bad we are. We're dead. We're bound in all of our sin. But here's the good news in verse 4, but God. Folks, anytime you're reading along in the Bible and God shows up, that's a game changer. When it says, but God, look at this. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he has quickened us. He has made us alive. That's what it means. Together with Christ and by grace you are saved. And he has raised up uh, us up together made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, our whole situation has been changed by God. That's awesome. And then it's for a reason, verse 7 says, that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And then verse 8, 9, and 10, you're probably familiar with. For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then I love verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Folks, we're his workmanship. That word workmanship is the word, uh, the word poema. It's poem with an A on the end of it. What does that mean? That means we're God's crafted work of art. 
We're not an afterthought. We're not a second thought. God created us all with a purpose and with a passion. What is it that you love to do? What is it you're passionate about? What, what is your gift? Do you like gardening? Do you like golf? Do you like uh, doing carpentry? Do you like doing crochet? Do you like music? Do you like computers? For me, it's sports. I love sports. I played three sports in high school. I've been coaching. I use sports as a way to share the gospel. Every summer, I do some type of mission trip. Folks, I've seen more people come to Christ through doing basketball camps than anything else I've done. So whatever it is you love to do, do it for Jesus. Amen? Because we're his workmanship. We're already created in Christ Jesus for good works. We don't do the good works to gain it. It's because we have that relationship. We want to live out our life and do the good works for him. And he's already prepared us for that. Amen? And then the last verse I want you to look at is verse 12. It ties it all together and summarizes. It's a reminder. Ephesians 2, 12, it says, that, in the time, that, that at that time you were without Christ. In other words, there was a time we were without Christ. Being aliens or strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. See, folks, we're without hope and without God in this world until Jesus comes into our life and changes everything. Amen? Amen. That's the thing we want to keep in mind. Folks, we are in the lost and found business. As we begin to land this plane and wrap it up, I want us to remember the conditions. What is it and why we're to pray for and share with lost people? The Bible tells us to. Jesus tells us to. Paul tells us to. Then the conditions of lostness without Christ. We're under God's wrath. We're helpless. We're hopeless. We're blind. We're bound. We're condemned. But folks, it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus can change all of that. And now, I want you to think with me about a couple of illustrations here as we begin to wrap this up. Think about that person God's put on your heart. A friend of mine, Pat Kilby, pastor's in Oklahoma now. He was in a Walmart in Waynesville one time, and he was watching this little boy. He's playing in the toy department, six-year-old little boy, pulling down toys, riding them around. He was in Walmart, just having a good old time. And all of a sudden, that little boy got tired of playing and realized his mom wasn't around. He looks down one aisle and didn't see his mom. He starts screaming, Mama, Mama, where are you? He looked down the other aisle, now he didn't see her. He's really screaming now, Mama, Mama, where are you? And Pat said when he got in his car and began to drive away, he's thinking about that little boy. He said he's just like people in our society in our culture. They're playing in the toy department of life until they discover they're lost. And then they start screaming out for a Messiah, for somebody to save them. Folks, you and I, we got people all around us. They're not screaming out loud like the little boy in Walmart, but in their heart, they are screaming for somebody to tell them the truth, somebody to show them the way home. It's just like I told you in Sunday school this morning. We were at a Mexican restaurant, and four different people sat down with us to ask questions. It was towards the afternoon time, and they just sat down and started talking to us. People are desperate. They want to know the truth. They're open to the gospel. Amen? I shared that story uh, that, about the little boy in Walmart at a prayer conference one time, and a lady literally ran up to me at the end of the service and said, I, I saw a story I've got to tell you. It's the reverse of your story. She said, I saw a mama in Walmart, I mean in Kmart, who had lost her little girl. Her name was Susie, and she was running through uh, Kmart yelling for Susie. Folks, if you lose a child, a little child in our culture, that's a desperate feeling. My son Dawson's 14 now. We were at a prayer conference in Conover one time. He was two years old, and I was waiting for my family to come to the dinner time before the, the conference started that night. And I called him and said, hey, aren't y'all coming to dinner? They said, Dad, you've got to pray. We can't find Dawson. We were right off of I-40. He'd gotten on the elevator and gotten off on another floor. It took about 40 minutes to find him. That's a desperate feeling. This mom going through Kmart was desperate. And the lady tells me this story because she watched it happen. She said, Marty, she said it was a beautiful thing. She said, the little girl came around the corner and she was crying. The mom was crying and yelling for Susie. Susie, where are you? Susie, Susie where are you? She said, all of a sudden, that little girl came around the corner. She saw her mom. She ran to her mom. Her mom dropped down on her knees and grabbed up her little girl in her arms and said, oh, Susie, I'm so glad I found you. I'm so glad I found you. Folks, that's a picture of God. That's a picture of God. Because the Bible says all of heaven rejoices when that one lost sheep is found. Amen? Isn't that amazing? That's the only time in Scripture it says all of heaven rejoices when that one lost sheep is found. Folks, if all of heaven's rejoicing over one thing, shouldn't we not be rejoicing as well? We should, we're in the lost and found business. God's called us to be concerned about that. It's almost March Madness time. Y'all remember uh, in 1983, Jim Valvano, NC State, they won a national championship. Y'all remember, they shouldn't have been there. It was a Cinderella story. They shouldn't have even been in the game. And that last shot goes in by accident. It was tipped in. And Jim Valvano's sitting on the edge of his seat. And when that shot goes in, he jumps off his seat like that. And he runs over here. He hugs somebody. He runs over here. He was just so full of himself, he just could not stop running around jumping up and down. Folks, that's what I think heaven looks like when that one lost sheep is found. It says all of heaven rejoices when that one lost sheep is found. Folks, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be concerned about people's souls and rejoicing when they're saved. Amen? Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for these precious people. Father, I pray that you're speaking to our hearts right now. Father, there's some people here today that just need to surrender their life in a fresh way. They just need to surrender to you and say, Lord, I want to be on mission with you. I want to finish well. I want to complete everything you have for me. And they just need to surrender in a fresh way. Father, there's some people here today that may have not, not 100% sure of their salvation. They're not 100% sure of what you, uh, who you are in their life. They're not sure they surrendered to you. Father, I want them to give their hearts to you today. I pray, Lord, that that's their desire, Father, because you care about their soul. And Father, all of us have somebody on our heart today that we're praying for. Lord, I pray that we'll fill up this altar to pray for that lost person, that family member, that friend, that relative, that associate, that neighbor that's on our heart. So, Father, I pray that we will pour out our hearts to you, and I pray, Father, that you will save those that we're holding up before you. Folks, if you, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to pray a prayer that's an example of how you can pray and ask Jesus into your heart. There's nothing magical about the prayer, but this is an example. If you're here today and you're not 100% sure, this is how you might want to pray. You might want to say something like this. This is how I prayed when I asked Jesus into my life. I said, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me, Lord, and come into my heart and cleanse me of all of my sin. Lord, I don't understand it at all, but I surrender my life to you as best I understand it, Lord. I surrender my life to you. I give you my life right now. And Father, I pray that you will fill me with your spirit and make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Amen. Folks, this is our time of invitation. If you would stand.